Hello, I'm Eileen Ruhoy, and I am a neurologist, and I'm the medical director of the Chiari EDS Center at Mount Sinai South Nassau. We're a fairly new center, and we're trying to build um, basically a multidisciplinary um, place for EDS patients to go. Um, and so today, I'm really happy to be here, and I thank you for inviting me. I, and I want to just take on the topic of the, what we've been referring to as the PENTAD patient. Um, and so we will go through what that is. I don't have any disclosures. Actually, I should play from the start. I should do this way. Okay, here we go. <laughs> I have no disclosures. So what is the Pentad? So the Pentad um, is... Um, what we is a is a is a combination of symptoms um, and diagnoses that we see in patients um, that present with similar kinds of concerns, um, and it usually involves. Um, although there occasionally there's some that uh, some diagnoses that replace one of these diagnoses, but the most common diagnoses in in the patient population that we see at the Chiari EDS Center have hypermobility type EDS. Uh, mast cell activation syndrome, which is an activation of the innate immune system, some level of autoimmunity, or as I refer to it as autoreactivity, which is some activation of the adaptive immune system, um, some combination thereof of small fiber neuropathy, dysautonomia, and dysmotility, and there's an overlap in all those diagnoses, and then cranial cervical instability and tethered cord, and I should probably add in there uh, Chiari as well. Um, so just going through the different PENTAD diagnoses, hypermobility type EDS is a heterogeneous, and EDS in general is a heterogeneous connective tissue disorder, but so is hypermobility type. Um, and it, it, it encompasses joint hypermobility, which is a very common um, part of patient's history, um, skin hyperextensibility, tissue fragility, there's usually a history of increased bruising, and then weakened vessel and visceral organ walls, Basically, wherever connective tissue lies, which is all over the body, um, there, there can potentially be involvement. So the gene of height mobility type EDS, as opposed to some of the other types, subtypes of EDS, is unknown. Um, but height mobility type EDS prevalence has been reported to be one in 5,000. There's a higher percentage of females that are affected. Um, usually we assess it by with something called the Byton score. And my next slide, has, or one of my sites, has a picture of, of the physical maneuvers that you do for a Byton score. It, you can get a total of nine, and it can be done in two minutes. So many um, practitioners will do the Byton score or in their office because it's easy to do. But frankly, uh, the history that's obtained, uh, you can usually pick up hypermobility EDS just based on their history. Um, there's usually a um, history of uh, physical trauma of like concussions and whiplash from motor vehicle accidents, um, joint, um, joint uh, trauma, uh, joint pain, joint damage. Uh, but because they're hypermobile, they're very often give a history of being a great gymnast and a great cheerleader, a great dancer, a great athlete overall. Um, in fact, watching the Olympics recently, seeing the gymnasts there, I, you know, thought myself, how many of these have hypermobile type EDS? So this is the bite and scoring uh, that I refer to. And basically we just look at hyperextension of the elbows and the knees. When they flex at the waist, can patients touch the floor with a flattened palm? Um, can they flex their thumb down to their forearm? Can they hyperextend their pinky fit past 90 um, degree angle? Um, and so you get points for each of these. But like I said, you know, this is not the these are not the only joints where you you find hypermobility. I mean, very often patients will show me how they have hypermobile small joints at the very tip of their fingers, for example. The PCPs and MCPs are all very hypermobile. Um, sometimes even their um, hip abduction and adduction is uh, quite quite hypermobile as well. Uh, the next diagnosis that's part of the PENTAD is mast cell activation syndrome, which in and of itself is a whole topic um, that I can talk about for probably hours. Um, it is in general a chronic multi-system, so it involves many organs, uh, illness with a lot of different symptoms that often confuse some doctors, um, as well as confuse some patients about why these things are happening to their bodies. It can be an acute in nature, so you can have reactions to things. In fact, very often there's a history of allergies, of some, some level of atopy. So like allergies or eczema or asthma. So a hypersensitivity and allergic kind of reaction to things. And it causes the mast cells, which are part of our innate immune system to 
uh, become reactive. So they are our first responders and they will degranulate. And while, yes, we very much often focus on the histamine that is released, there are over 200 different mediators, most of which are very inflammatory. Um, so it's not just about the histamine. And triggers can be anything from, uh, you know, infections to viruses, to bacterium, parasites, fung fungi, mold, um, to different types of foods, even excipients in certain medications and supplements can they can be sensitive to. So you try to treat, but sometimes they have to be compounded to remove the excipients of the medications. Uh, sunlight, some patients have, have just a, a mast cell reaction to, to being exposed to the sun, noise, water, smells, some you know, certain pungent odors can sometimes trigger a mast cell reaction. Even minimal exertion will sometimes trigger mass activation. I mean, uh, you know, post-exercise asthmatic or reactive airway as, we, has, as it has been referred to can, is, can, is now thought to be a mass cell activation. And pain, you know, pain in our bodies does trigger certain release of hormones and transmitters um, a, a, along with mass cell degranulation, but also endogenous triggers. You know, we often talk about how patients with mass cell activation are very sensitive to their environment. I mean, and we all are sensitive to our environment to some extent um, because our environment is dirty. We are exposed to more things than we've ever been exposed to before. You know, I, my PhD is in environmental toxicology. And when I did my dissertation on pharmaceutical residues in our waters, and I did water sampling studies, I was astounded at what we find just in our waterways. Um, but our environment is full of things that we're now exposed to that we weren't really meant to be exposed to and we're exposed over decades of life. So we all have developed some level of chronic exposure sensitivity, but those with mast cell activation syndrome have it exponentially so. But there are also endogenous triggers and there are many examples of, of this physiologically and one that I gave just because it refers to myelin, which is, you know, part of the neurological system, um, um, protease that is, that is released from the mast cells degrade myelin. And then myelin in and of itself turns around and, and, and can stimulate degranulation of the mast cells, which then just releases more proteases. So there are also endogenous triggers that provoke mast cell degranulation. And so this is just a nice little uh, visual. Some people are visual learners. And so I like to put out visuals, um, some people to, to sort of look at. And I'm not going to go through this whole chart because there's obviously a lot on it. It does show how mast cells are in different organ systems, how there are different organ system involvements, how it, how how they are affected by the mast cell degranulation and the symptoms that can occur because of that particular organ system. And I'm happy to share my slides, and you and you know you can have this this little figure um, to to review and, and understand more about how mast cells can cause a lot of different varied symptoms and organ involvement. And so when the innate immune system, which are, again are the mast cells are under perpetual activation, so constantly degranulating, and it's usually because they perceive some level of danger in their environment. As I said, they're our first responders. And so they perceive some danger. And again, it's some exposure that our bodies are sensitive to. So the mast cells think, oh, that's a, that's a danger. And so there's a signal that goes on within them that causes them to degranulate. And when they're constantly degranulating and constantly feeling like they're fighting a war and then they're feeling like they're losing the war, um, what we find is sometimes they recruit the adaptive immune system, which is the T and B cells that, that make the antibodies. And over time, when the adaptive immune system is being perpetually recruited and provoked, um, it, can, it can ultimately become um, autoreactive. So it sort of turns on itself basically and recognizes something of, of the self as foreign. And that's basically what an autoimmune disorder is. And I, you know, we don't think that you necessarily form a true autoimmune disease, but there is clear evidence um, that there is autoreactivity at the very least. And this can come from just, again, perpetual exposures of infection, of moldy environments, of other things in our environments, different contaminants and toxicants, of different foods and certain of stress in our lives, which we all have, and, and more so in recent times. So it develops these antibodies, again, which are, you know, things that are primed to recognize usually something foreign, but when it becomes autoreactive, it recognizes something of the self, of whether it's within 
our, you know, one of our cellular membranes or one of our cells in an organ system, one of the ganglion, a junction. Of, uh, there's a, a, a common, um, there are certain autoimmune disorders that have antibodies against the neuromuscular junction where the nerve and the muscle speak to one another. There are different channels. So all the ion channels like the potassium and the calcium and the sodium channels, they all have receptors that can be recognized by, by certain antibodies when they become autoreactive and can cause certain symptoms. That's why it's important because it can potentially cause certain symptoms if these antibodies are, are targeting pieces of our self and pieces of our organ systems and pieces of our physiology. And the thing, the reason why we look for that um, in these pentad patients is because it can offer a focus of treatment. So if it's about the immune system, we, we, we have some options for treatment in terms of immunomodulators, immunosuppressants, and so on. Um, another one of the diagnoses of the pentad patients is dysautonomia. Um, it seems like the baroreceptors in patients who are hypermobile um, have uh, are in, are are more sensitive. Um, so there's uh, very often uh, we find uh, diagnoses of orthostatic hypotension or postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome POTS. This can be confirmed by autonomic testing if possible. That's hard to find. Um, not every place does autonomic testing. I've been doing it in my Seattle clinic and soon we'll be doing it at the Mount Sinai Chiari EDS Center because I do think it's important to really qualify what kind of dysautonomia there is. It's very often just labeled as POTS and most dysautonomia autonomias, most um, auto disorders of the autonomic nervous system can present as POTS or even present as orthostatic hypotension. You can do a NASA lean test in the clinic um, where you have the, or that you can even have them do it at home and you give them this chart where they test their blood pressure and pulse when they're lying down and when they're standing and it gives some instructions on timing of, of when to do it. Um, but it's not, as, um, it's not as reliable as true autonomic testing, which has heart rate, deep breathing, the tilt table, Valsalva, and then the QSAR. So orthostatic hypotension is basically a sustained reduction of blood pressure, um, whereas postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome um, does not, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't involve the blood pressure as often. It's usually about um, an increase of the heart rate um, with head up tilt or when standing. And so usually you, these are, and, and what's important is that these changes of heart rate and or blood pressure come with symptoms and that's what's important. Um, so, and then there's different subtypes of POTS. There's neuropathic, hyperagenergic, and volume dysregulation. But the symptoms are important, right? So is it symptomatic? Is the elevation in heart rate symptomatic? Is the decrease of blood pressure symptomatic? Um, and so there's lots of different symptoms, of course, um, that are orthostatic in nature. And this is a, a list of, of, this, of the symptoms. And, and again, with POTS specifically, tachycardia, I mean, it's in its name. So it's, we consider it a cardinal feature, but you know, you, I, you have, you have, when you ask enough questions, you find that these patients are experiencing a lot of these symptoms, some of them you know, subtle, and they, don't, they didn't even recognize it might be a symptom until you ask them about it. And then many even have non-orthostatic symptoms um, and that they have chronic fatigue. In fact, there's a, a subset of patients with hypermobility type EDS that have um, ME-CFS, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. They very often have circadian rhythm disorders. Usually sleep, the sleep-wake wake cycle is off and they're not sleeping well. Um, there's very often gastrointestinal difficulties, which is actually one of the diagnoses that we'll talk about. Interstitial cystitis, so often they have a diagnosis of interstitial cystitis or even pelvic congestion syndrome, exercise intolerance, so even the slightest bit of exertion um, gives them a feeling of malaise and fatigue, and they definitely have fatigability, so they are unable to maintain, so exercise intolerance refers to specific exercise, but fatigability, even some patients get fatigued just from the act of eating or the act of talking, um, a doctor's appointment can wipe them out for hours or even days sometimes. So, and sometimes these symptoms can be exacerbated by medications um, that patients are put on for various other diagnoses or reasons. Um, sometimes the, the, the medications that we use for the symptoms actually can provoke more of the symptoms. Prolonged recumbency, so lying in bed for long periods of time or sitting for long periods of time, heavy meals, heat exposure, intense physical activity and illness certainly. So anytime, even a cold can sometimes um, flare these symptoms. And that is, is, is very common in neurological diseases and neuro and diseases overall, um, that any kind of virus can actually provoke symptoms and cause a flare. 
uh, or, or cause what we referred to as a relapse sometimes. And so these, so these symptoms are, they're sort of very, they're very, um, you know, sensitive and, uh, you know, you have to sort of nurture your body so that you don't go into a flare, into a relapse. And that could be hard for some patients who are trying to live a life of, you know, family, community, friends, social engagements, working, you know, so it could be very difficult for patients and impair quality of life. And this is just, you know, so what we talk about um, po postural changes of autonomic function. So when, when patients will stand, you know, what will happen is there's a pooling of blood in the splenic mesenteric bed, basically. And so you can, sometimes it can be difficult to find the radial pulse. They can get acral coldness, swelling, and blueness, which is very often, you know, patients will say, I have Raynaud's phenomenon because they get blueness of their fingertips or even of their toes. And sometimes it's related to the autonomic changes. Another diagnosis is small fiber neuropathy, which is very much, again, as I said, a lot of this overlaps because the small fibers um, are part of our autonomic nervous system. They control um, our, the motility of our GI tract, for example. Um, true small fiber neuropathy can cause paresthesias or what we refer to as dysesthesia. So there's pain and it's usually patchy type pain. It's not a pain of a large fiber neuropathy, but it, it can be. Um, so, and so they're, they feel, you know, like stabbing pains or electrical pains or even numbness, which is not a comfortable kind of numbness, not that there is a comfortable numbness, but a numbness that's really bothersome um, and uh, a tingling. Um, so, and then there are autonomic systems, symptoms, as I said, that small fibers do control the gastrointestinal system, the cardiovascular system, the cutaneous vasomotor system. So there's an alteration in sweat and sweat function and the urogenital system. There's often temper, temper, temperature dysregulations or pa patients are cold when they shouldn't be cold or hot when they shouldn't be hot. Oftentimes hot showers will flare them. Um, and it's been increasingly identified in hypermobile type EDS. And in fact, there was recent studies that show that um, you can find synuclein on, so you do a skin biopsy to diagnose small fiber neuropathy, um, but you can also test on that same skin biopsy synuclein deposits. And there's been some small amounts of research that suggests that the synuclein um, found is uh, consistent with a more severe type of POTS, which just goes to what I was saying earlier that um, it, there might be some other underlying um, autonomic disorder that is just sort of, se it's seemingly like POTS on its surface. Um, because the motility is affected by small fiber neuropathy, very often there's constipation or downright gastroparesis, and that can lead to stagnation of, of, waste, of, of waste, basically. So there's that results in altered microbiome, what's been referred to as leaky gut, but increases gut permeability. Um, and then it can cause all kinds of leaky gut type of symptoms. So as I said, you do a skin biopsy to determine small fiber neuropathy. It measures the intraepidermal innervation on the, by the pathologist. Um, EMG, I often do EMGs because uh, well, EMGs don't pick up small fibers. It really only diagnoses large fibers, but you wanna make sure that there isn't a large fiber component. Um, there's a bunch of labs that we do for other reasons for neuropathy. Um, so uh, it's important to at least sort of, you know, cover all your bases and look for different labs. But 50% of the time it's idiopathic. We cannot find reason. And we just, like I said, that's why we call it the pentad patient. We see this in this, in this constellation of, of symptoms. And then there's a, you know, in the hypermobile type EDS, because it is a connective tissue disorder, um, we very often see cranial cervical instability, Chiari and tethered cord. And so, um, you know, so we, in fact, we see Chiari um, in association with cranial cervical instability. CCI can, can complicate Chiari, and it's important to recognize when CCI exists. And CCI is basically an unstable C0, C1, and sometimes involving C2 joint. Um, and when that joint is unstable, it can cause um, what we refer to as cervical medullary syndrome, which is compression of the ventral brainstem, and that's where the medulla oblongata sits, um, compression of the vertebral arteries, sometimes alteration of, of cerebral spinal fluid flow, um, and, and um, and what's 
what we think is going on is because that joint is held together by multiple different ligaments. And because hypermobile type EDS patients have ligamentous laxity at, it, at, at, at its baseline. Um, and then very often in these patients' histories because of mass activation, for example, or because of dysautonomia, or again, because they were once good athletes, so they were more at risk of things like concussions and whiplash and other physical trauma. Um, and um, they're also, the, because mass activation sometimes results in innate and adaptive immune activation that's overly activated. So there's some level of immune risk. So these patients are often vulnerable to infections. Um, all of this causes additional inflammation to these ligaments that were lax at, at its baseline and now just creates more laxity. And then over time with aging, um, the cranial cervical instability um, leads to furthering of the cervical medullary syndrome and furthering of symptoms and ultimately um, need surgical intervention for correction. And this is just a picture showing the different ligaments and there are more that are not represented in this picture. Um, but these are the these are the main ligaments that try to hold together that the 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 the, the, the cranial cervical joint, you know, so where basically the skull meets C1. Um, and then along with the hypermobile EDS um, and other connective tissues as well, um, you can have a lot of different other spinal column involvement because of the ligament dyslaxity, because the ligaments do sort of try to keep everything aligned, of course, um, including tethered cord. And also focal sinus stenosis, we're finding this more and more in patients with Chiari and CCI. Um, in fact, the transverse sigmoid sinus seems to be the most common one um, involved where there's a stenosis. Um, and that's, of course, because the connective tissue, which is part of the vessels and the vessel walls, um, sometimes these vessels don't deliver um, the blood flow as appropriately because it becomes stenosis, it sort of collapses upon itself. Um, so there's a lot of talk about infection being a catalyst to some of the, these pentad diagnoses because you know, to just be born with ligament dyslaxity is not thought to be pathogenic in and of itself. I mean, again, that's why there are some great athletes out there, some great gymnasts and phenomenal dancers, but there's something along the way of their lives that seem to sort of seem to make, um, uh, make this ligament dyslaxity a risk factor for further diagnoses that I just sort of went through that created the pentad. And you know, we're now starting to talk about, this is the septad because we're finding more and more evidence of infection. Um, you know, uh, the SIBO diagnoses that many patients come with along with the autoimmunity, the mast cell, the CCI, the hypermobility, the dysautonomia. Um, we're, we're learning that basically wherever connected tissue lies, you can, you can basically have organ malfunction and that could be basically be any organ. So there's a lot of different diagnoses that patients have been given over the years that seem to be related to this underlying common denominator of a connective tissue problem. Um, so that is, is my talk. And, and as I said, I know it's a lot of information and each one of those slides can probably be a talk of its own, but it's important to sort of recognize that a lot of these diagnoses and symptoms that patients are feeling, um, we recognize this as a constellation and we are working towards trying to understand more about it. Um, so, and I'm happy to take any questions. Hi everybody, this is Eric Burning. Um, thank you very much. That was very informative and, and just, you know, a lot of stuff that, we just don't hear a lot about. So uh, folks, you're all muted. So if you want to ask a question, please post your question in the chat. Um, and then we'll go through those and- um, I don't know how to do it. Read them off. There's a chat function at the bottom. If you're on a computer at the bottom of the screen, it'll say chat. And then you can just type in um, your questions as necessary. Okay, got our first one. Can you say a few words about various treatment options for the ten pentad features of the syndrome? That's a really good question. So there are a lot of treatment options, certainly, and uh, each each diagnosis has its own treatment option. But oftentimes we start treating one diagnosis and we see improvement in another. Sometimes we see worsening of another. But like for mast cell, for example, I mean, so. Again, we focus in on the histamine because it is a predominant mediator that comes out of the mast cells. And so very often it starts with the, you know, the low hanging fruit, the antihistamines, um, which you, know, you can get over the counter these days, but there are some real good ones that you could have prescribed. 
Um, what's interesting about the antihistamines is that they're H1, H2 antagonists. You know, the central nervous system contains H3, H4. So it doesn't necessarily target a lot of neurological symptoms that might come from mast cells, though a class of medications referred to as the mast cell stabilizers, which just try to stabilize the mast cells so they don't degranulate and release any of their mediators, or at least very few of them, um, can sometimes be a little bit more useful, um, especially in, in the pentad uh, context. Um, so it's usually the antihistamines. There are some uh, leukotriene an uh, antagonists that we use um, and mast cell stabilizers are really the most common ones um, that are considered. For dysautonomia, there's quite a few as well. And it sort of depends upon where someone's blood pressure and heart rate may lie. I mean, obviously there's the beta blockers. Um, there's some of the vasopressors. Um, so, and, so and even sometimes correcting um, heart rate um, abnormalities might correct some of the blood pressure um, uh, uh, abnormalities just because of the blood pressure's response to changes in heart rates. So there's a lot of different medications along those lines. Of course, for any kind of dysmotility of the gut, you know, depending upon what symptom there is, there's lots of different treatment options for that, frankly. Um, and, you know, and, and these range from, you know, more, you know, alternative to conventional, you know, usually there's an integrative approach for these. I mean, for example, treatment of POTS, um, conservative treatment, which, you know, for the most part, I start with, unless, of course, you know, the symptoms are truly debilitating, you know, the, these are conservative measures like hydration with electrolytes, mostly salt tabs tablets are the easiest way to do it, um, compression abdominal binders, compression socks or stockings. You know, sometimes I uh, even recommend if patients are able to, because of the exercise intolerance, this is sometimes difficult, but to really work on strength of the lower limb musculature, because that helps um, place um, good strength around the venous valves to help the, the veins push blood back up. Don't forget, getting blood up to the brain works against gravity. So we have to do all we can to sort of push blood back up. And that's why I, I did have that slide to show that there is um, pooling of the blood in this blanket mesenteric bed. And so it's important to push it back up basically. So there are a lot of conservative measures. Um, I even have patients, you know, to when they're lying down to sit up slowly, put their feet flat on the floor, allow, allow calibration to occur. But we usually have to go to some level of medication and it really often depends upon the patient. I don't think that there's a great template. I, I like to believe that we all just sort of listen to the patient's symptoms and do our exam and do some labs and sort of see where the patient is. And we sort of just decide upon the best regimen for that. Obviously we don't have, you know, the Holy Grail um, for me at least is like, how do I fix your connective tissue? Because that sort of seems to be the common denominator but there is no um, great way of doing that yet. Um, so we sort of fix, you know, in the mass, there's a, mast cells are ubiquitous, they're all over our bodies but there's a large pr pr proportion of them that are contained within the central nervous system certainly but also within the, the connective tissue. And so we think that that is one of the reasons why there's so much mast cell activation is that the ligaments, which are usually sort of protecting and nurturing those mast cells or because they're a little bit um, looser, the mast cells are a little bit more open to things that are floating around in the bloodstream, which is why we think there is this exposure component that has made things worse for patients. And that's why we, we are now talking a lot about infectious problems, um, viruses and bacterium um, as, and mold exposure, things of that nature that might be um, furthering the symptoms in these patients. So anyway, so back you know, regarding treatment, really it sort of depends upon any of these diagnoses, where they sit for a particular patient, what's their most pr most predominant concern. That's generally where I start with, like what's what's the, the the problematic symptom that's impairing your quality of life, and it doesn't have to be one, of course, but it's sort of where we start with regards to treatment. I think I'm I think I'm rambling at this point. Treatment <laughs> treatment is a whole topic of itself. <laughs> Can a patient have Chiari and fibromyalgia? Yes, absolutely. Um, fibromyalgia is one of those interesting diagnoses that now there's an overlap with ME-CFS and we're now thinking that what was thought to be fibromyalgia when you actually, when you talk to the patients and, and ask a lot more questions about their symptoms that they have been having, that they are having, um, then you find that they tend to very often meet the criteria that was put forth by both the Institute of Medicine and the, and the CDC about ME-CFS and they do seem to meet criteria. And so then you, you talk a little bit further and you find that they have hypermobility for example. And so then, then, then it becomes sort of a connective tissue concern. And again, connect, you know, the fascia that holds the muscle is connective tissue, and then muscles are attached to bone by connective tissue. And so, as I've said a couple of times, connective tissue is, is everywhere. So we do think that that fibromyalgia 
um, is part of this whole constellation. And, you know, I, I think I, I think that it's really a naming game at this point, you know, to sort of what what are we going to name things and it almost really doesn't matter because the symptoms are the same right so um, it's like tomato tomato I guess but I, I think it helps to name it because it helps to study it if you have a name for something, but what what had been called fibromyalgia now is sort of being reconsidered because there was a study done uh, several years ago actually I've known about this before, you know when we were still thinking of fibromyalgia as its own unique entity that um, at least 40% if not 50 percent of patients with fibromyalgia have small fiber neuropathy that are that are it's that are proven by by skin biopsy so if you think back to what i was talking about with, with small fiber neuropathy it does fit into that pentad of, of patient complex so so i do think there is a very significant and real overlap in, in a fibromyalgia diagnosis is there a clear diagnostic test for mast cell dysfunction and then added to that, um, what's the best way to monitor mast cell if you are um, diagnosed with it? So uh, so there are screening tests for mast cell. Um, these, these laboratory tests are notoriously difficult to do. They're technically difficult. Um, so what I always tell patients is that you can rule it in with abnormal labs. I don't rule, I can't rule it out with normal labs because I'm only, you. it's not, I only usually do the mast cell screen on patients who come with symptoms that are consistent with mast cell activation. So I already have a high clinical suspicion. So I do a fairly extensive mast cell screen um, and, you know, and very often I actually find an abnormality because my clinical suspicion is so high when I'm, when I'm ordering these labs. And I think that's important. I think clinical judgment actually plays a very large role in this. You know, I think that we have the ability to run lots of tests and do lots of workup, um, but you know, the sensitivity and specificity are important in, in everything that we order. And I think that if you have a high clinical suspicion, then it's worthwhile to do the testing to follow up on that. So I do a fairly decent mast cell screen and, and we'll often find um, some evidence of mast cell activation. But even when I don't, if I still have a high clinical suspicion, I explain to patients that these tests are, are technically challenging to do. And I can't always know for sure that the lab had done them correctly. So I, I will often start treatment because as I said, you can start as easy as just trying some antihistamines. So it's a fairly you know, no harm game. Um, so you can try some antihistamines. And then at some point in, you know, within six months, if the symptoms still persist, despite um, me trying some treatment, um, I will repeat the labs um, regardless. So so there, there, yes, to answer the question, there are laboratory tests that you can do for mast cell activation because of the different mediators that are released. So it's not just about, oh, your histamine is normal. And that's why I make a point of, of saying that there are other mediators to look for. Um, and I forgot the next part of the question. Oh, how to monitor. Um, well, it really depends how your mast cell uh, manifests. So uh, what you're allergic to, allergic to, what you're sensitive to, um, are how, how, where does that sensitivity lie under treatment? So very often, you know, patients will say, you know, I used to only be able to tolerate three foods. Um, and then we get them on a good mast cell regimen, which admittedly is a trial and error for every patient. So there's no blueprint like, oh, you just need these three drugs. It really is trial and error with every patient because there are a lot of things that we can do. Um, but when we find that regimen that works well for patients, then, then you hear, well, now I could, I can tolerate 10 foods. You know, I was able to add a few additional foods. I was able to go to this particular location that usually has an odor that I'm very sensitive to. Um, so you definitely hear improvement in their symptoms. And I try to focus in on what their predominant symptoms were. And that's how I, I try to help them manage it. And sometimes I ask them to keep little journals as to what they're experiencing and how they're experiencing it. So there are ways of, of managing how your mast cells are doing, short of, of having to run laboratory tests all the time, which can be expensive and bothersome. And hypermobility type EDS patients often don't have great veins. And so I try not to do you know, repeated blood draws if we can avoid it. Um, should most Chiari patients be routinely, test, routinely tested or considered to rule out hypermobile EDS? I think that, well, in terms of testing, I, I think that it's, it's really a conversation to be had to, 
about high mobility EDS and you can have the bite and testing done and you know people can even do it on their own at home, which is why I showed that slide of what you know so you, you, know, you do these things and hyperextension of your knees and then bend down and touch the floor. So it's not a matter of really testing for it. it I and mean, if you have a Chiari, I do think it's worthwhile to test for hypermobility of yourself or even talk to uh, you want your doctors and ask them to test you for hypermobility. Um, and, and also, like I said, sometimes it's just in the history. There's often clues in the history, like, oh, you know, my shoulder used to come out a lot. That's sometimes part of the history. I've always had problems with my ankles rolling and I would fall all the time. I was, you know, so, you know, sometimes you can find it in the, in the history. So there are so many co comorbidities with these patients, CCI, Chiari, um, IJV, compression, Eagles. What's the prevailing wisdom about where to start first? Is there, does there seem to be a root cause? Well, I, I, we don't know the root cause. As I said, the, um, the, the, we think that it's related to the connected tissue disorder, though we, we haven't been able to prove it yet. Um, you know, we look for genetic variants that are associated with hypermobility type EDS. Um, I definitely see it run in families. So there, there seems to be a familial component. Um, I see it regularly run in families, though not always, but very often. So I think there's a genetic variant that we just haven't identified yet. Um, and I think that uh, I think that when we find that variant, we'll understand more about what the connective tissue is, the connective tissue problem is, why it's so fragile, and why it, why it doesn't seem to allow our ligaments to withstand the hustle and bustle of our daily lives and our daily movement, which is what creates a lot of this um, organ malfunction and dysfunction. So you know, I, and I think about even the associated with mast cells. You know, mast cells have a large um, percentage, it, it, they hold a lot of um, um, MMPs, which are proteases that break down connective tissue, specifically certain collagen types. And I think it's four, five, and 10. I could be wrong. Um, but it, it, I, in fact, MMP9 is one of the um, mast cell screenings that I do. Um, and I think it, and it, if, it, if it's positive, then th there's a clear connection with mast cell and connective tissue um, because it does break down some of the collagen types. So um, I think that a lot more research needs to be done in this area. And that's what we're doing at the Chiari EDS Center. Actually, we have, you know, the nice thing about our center is that we've got three arms. We've got a medical arm, we've got a surgical arm, and then we have a research arm. And so we have a research team that are trying to answer these questions and more, um, as well as trying to, to um, focus in on what the best treatment options are for these patients, because we treat them medically, we treat them surgically, and we want to always learn more. And um, and so we're doing the research. So we are trying to answer that question. Um, and hopefully we will come up with an answer, <laughs> a better answer than I just gave, I suppose. <laughs> but I do think it's, I do think that underlying all of this is a connective tissue issue. I didn't mean to rhyme, connective tissue problem. Yeah. What medication works before? for small fiber neuropathy symptoms? Um, well, you know, we usually start with the neuropathic pain medication. So like the gabapentin and the pregabalin um, can sometimes be helpful. Again, if the small, if you're talking about the neuropathic symptoms of small fiber neuropathy, that is where we start. Small fiber neuropathy can also cause other kinds of symptoms just based on its association with the, with autonomic control. So if it's, you know, causing problems in the GI tract, then we try to fix that. If it's causing problems in the general urinary tract or the cardiovascular you know, system, we focus in on those problems. But in terms of pure Neuropath neuropathic kind of symptoms, we start with the neuropathic pain medications, and that's usually got pentin pregabalin. Sometimes we use Cymbalta, I've used amitriptyline. Um, so, um, so there's lots of different options, really, to be, to be honest. But it really, um, there's no, you know, when we find evidence of autoimmunity, sometimes we'll use like immunomodulators, either, whether it's either steroids or IVIG um, or some of the other immunosuppressants, some of the steroid sparing agents. Um, if it's really severe and debilitating and impairing quality of life, if we have evidence of immune activation that's we think is is contributing to the, the neuropathy, then we will go down that route. But again, we always start, you know, more conservative and see what kind of response an individual patient will have. Thank you. Is there much known about the genetic 
predisposition for HCDS? Uh, do you see it run in families? Yeah, I mean, as I said, I have seen it run in families. So I do think there is a genetic predisposition. Um, and I think that, and we don't know the gene variant yet. And uh, I know that there are some labs that are actually looking for the gene variant. So that will be exciting when we find it because then we'll actually have a more of a definitive um, marker to test for a gene variant to test for. Um, so that will, will be nice, but right now we don't know it. I had surgery five years ago. I'm having trouble finding a doctor in Houston, Texas. They look at my scans and tell me that my surgery, they look at my scans and tell me my surgery was successful, so I am cured. I have constant headaches, pain everywhere, fluid drainage in my ears, numbness tingling in my hands and feet, burning pain in my legs and feet. Rheumatologist says ANA positive is a false positive. Elevated liver enzymes and lab work that show infection are basically ignored. I'm at the point of giving up. I would recommend, you know, the EDS Society actually has a, a great directory of physicians and uh, all across the country. And while I can't guarantee they have one in Houston, I know that they're a great resource for a lot of patients. I would recommend finding a doctor who works with EDS patients regularly. Um, and that's a great resource for it. I don't think we asked this one. How often do you see Chiari with or without syrinx in combination with EDS or with Pentad? Um, I see Chiari fairly often um, with the Pentad. I don't see the uh, syrinx as often. Um, I, and I, I, unfortunately, I don't have percentages. To, I mean, statistics really. I could, you know, I haven't, I haven't um, done that. I haven't compiled the numbers yet to give more specific statistics, which I would, I would like to do. I'd like to be more specific, but I regularly do see Chiari, Chiari ones with, with the Pentad patients. Um, and they are usually the ones that have CCI, which again is usually why I'm a neurologist. So I, I would, I would argue that my population is somewhat skewed. Um, so I, I wouldn't apply this to the general pop, Pentad population necessarily. Um, I think that those who are referred to a neurologist are, are, like I said, skewed. So, but, so I do see Chiari fairly regularly and not as often with the syrinx, but I have seen it with the syrinx. Um, it just moved on me again. So annoying. Is there a connection between SFN and fibro? This is gonna be the last one that we're gonna take now. There is, and as I said earlier, um, the, we've long known, you know, there was studies done many years ago before even um, we recognized this Pentad patient um, that at least 40% of patients who have a fibromyalgia diagnosis have small fibroneuropathy, again, proven on, on biopsy. So not just by clinical symptoms, by, by skin biopsy. Um, and I think, I actually think it's, it's, it's higher than that. So I, there is a connection with small fibroneuropathy and fibromyalgia, and it's, it might not be a direct connection between the two, but rather that overall connection, connection with the connective tissue problem um, in, in the Pentad patient, but there is, there is a connection. Okay, well, I wanna thank you, Dr. Ruhoy, for tonight. I think it was excellent. I'm seeing all the comments on here. If anybody does have questions that weren't answered, if they wanna send them over to me, I can forward them to Dr. Ruhoy and she can send them back, okay? Yes, um, I wanna thank you again and thank everybody for attending and we really enjoyed it. It was very informative. Thank you. I was very happy to be here. So let Thanks. me know if you have any other questions. Okay, fantastic. Thanks again. All have right. a good night. Bye-bye.